Okay, people are beginning to join the join the session today. Um, if you haven't already, please say hello in the chat box so that everyone knows that you're here and where you're from. Got a great session for you today. Some really, really wonderful panelists and just generally super, super nice human beings. Okay, wonderful introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Marie Blaschka, and uh, I'm uh, from the uh, from the Eden Organization, chair of the board of the Eden Fellows, and uh, I have a wonderful session for you today. Uh, it's called Moving to the Next Phase of Online. How can we improve on what we've done so far? And as I mentioned, we have some really, really fantastic panelists today who are going to be talking about how can we move on to um, how can we manage this, the current situation that we're in? We're, we've, we've gotten past the emergency phase. We're moving into, you know, trying to improve on things, trying to find a way um, to adapt to the, the new normal. How, how can we do that? And so uh, we've got three, three wonderful presenters here to share their experiences with, with you today. Um, and, uh, but first, I want to just say a couple of admin things. If you have uh, questions, be sure to put them in the Q&A box. And if you are on YouTube, um, you can enter your questions into the chat area, uh, and they will be channeled into the Zoom room. Um, and, but if you are in the Zoom session, please enter your questions into the Q&A area uh, so that we don't have to follow a, a number of different uh, communication channels. Uh, and we can get all your questions to our panelists. So as I mentioned, today's session today is about how can we improve on what we've done so far. Our first panelist is Alexandra Miha, and she, Miha, and she is Education Specialist and Learning Experience Designer at the University of College uh, London. And then we've also got Marcy Powell uh, from Marcy Powell and Associates. Uh, she is the CEO of that organization from the United States. Uh, thank you, Marcy, for getting up so early this morning to be with us. And we have Richard Powers, who is project coordinator at the Professional School of Education, Stuttgart Ludwigsburg in Germany. And so I'd like to start out with Alexandra, who will be talking about what's next for faculty development. As I mentioned, Alexandra is a uh, education specialist and learning experience designer with over a decade of experience in European higher education. She's currently working as a learning designer at the University of College London, UCL. And previously, she worked as a researcher and curriculum designer um, at the <laughs> Institute of European Studies, uh, Free University uh, Brazil, uh, Brussels, and led the Center for Teaching Innovations at the Hete uh, School of Governance in Berlin. Alexander has a strong background in e-learning, learning design, and innovative learning uh, and teaching strategies. And in her PhD, she analyzed how far technology is used in teaching practices at European universities. And I'm very, very much looking forward to hearing her share uh, her experiences and tips with us today. Alexandra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lisa Marie, for your introduction. I will start sharing my screen. Um, and let's hope it works. Yes. Um, Thanks a lot for joining us today. And I'm really, really grateful uh, to Eden for inviting me and inviting the three of us for, for a really important, for discussing a really important topic today. And this is how are we gonna move beyond this emergency uh, stage uh, in tackling online education and what are the next steps? And today we're gonna talk both about next steps for teachers and for, for faculty and for students. Uh, what I'm going to talk about um, in my short presentation, but I would really love to, to start up the discussion actually with, with my slides, is more to, to stir up some, some ideas and, uh, from your side, uh, is what is next for faculty development. So I'm going to present very, very briefly some ideas and, and uh, 
uh, thoughts I had from my own experience and from what I've been observing in the past six months, uh, what happened in terms of faculty development and support at various universities, uh, mainly across Europe, but of course uh, globally as well. Um, I'm going to try to problematize that a bit and, and try to discuss what are the challenges with those approaches. Of course, they were rather emergency approaches. What were the challenges? What are the challenges? And then, of course, try to put forward some ideas on how we can respond to that and, and try to move forward uh, in a more coherent and consistent manner. So first of all, um, some thoughts about faculty development and support in times of pandemic. So basically, in the past six months, uh, the whole higher education landscape was turned upside down. And a lot of our assumptions on how we teach, how students learn, how our learning spaces look have been challenged, to say the least. Um, the role of the educator as well has been challenged. So there was a lot going on. Uh, and we all know that academia is not um, always very friendly towards change. But now we were all forced to, to at least reassess the old, ways, the old ways of doing things. So what happened in, in response to this was actually, uh, on a very positive note, extremely, extremely interesting to watch, at least for a person like me who has been observing and working with faculty for about 13 years now, uh, especially on how they interact with technology. So what happened in the past six months actually was amazing, uh, as many educators have taken up, of course, being forced uh, uh, teaching online. Um, I'm not sure how that will develop in the future. It's too early to predict, but there has been a lot, a lot of support and faculty, rapid faculty development um, going on in many universities uh, across the globe in the past six months. Uh, so there has been a lot of effort and especially uh, centers for teaching and learning or educational development, educa educational technology or digital education teams, uh, depending how they are called uh, in different institutions, they were at the center of this. They, they mobilized themselves very, very quickly uh, and tried and managed in, in, in most cases to provide uh, really excellent uh, trainings, resources, workshops. I'm going to explain uh, or talk, talk more about it in a second. So um, that changed overnight. Sometimes they, they became uh, really the center of, of the faculty development uh, efforts uh, within their institutions. Um, now, of course, this has taken or, or has, has gone through different stages already in the past months. First of all, it was really reactive. So overnight, things had to move online. So a teacher, well, lecturers, academics had to uh, basically shift their courses. It, it, they couldn't redesign. It was really a shift to, to the online environment. So they had to get a lot of help with that, literally moving the courses online for the remaining of, of the term or, or the semester. And of course, later on, so that was the reactive part. Later on, it all became a little bit more proactive. Uh, a lot of these centers and teams have worked throughout the summer tirelessly to actually bring uh, or, or bring forward a more coherent program of training and, and, and uh, resource uh, management uh, on the topic of online education. Uh, another interesting thing I noticed is that it was all a mix between general and more discipline specific approaches. So on the one hand, of course, we as, as learning designers want to to um, to uh, have everything done by the book. So let's say that using the general design learning design principles and instructional design principles. Uh, but of course, we have to also be very very aware that each discipline uh, has its own um, patterns. So of course, uh, the new uh, the, the course the online courses had to follow as well uh, as the general design patterns, also more discipline specific approaches. So I'm going to talk about those as well in a second. Uh, and last but not least, it's also been a, a, a very very difficult balance to reach between pedagogy and technology focused um, uh, faculty development. I'm going to actually try to, to, to give some more examples of that now to, to actually illustrate what, what I've been saying. So, um, of course, this is not an exhaustive list. As I said, there have been a huge number of initiatives uh, across the world. And, and of course, the, 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 um, the amount and the, the type of resources put into it varies a lot from institution to institution, even within the same country. Um, but I just try to, to, to pick up on some examples that have been uh, used uh, relatively generally uh, uh, across the board. So first of all, uh, self-paced online courses. Also, 
usually based on the on the virtual learning environment of their respective university um, they they were actually uh, developed in order to include a lot of resources uh, to include a lot of guidance uh, first in the emergency uh, emergency stage and then later on uh, a little bit more coordinated uh, towards the start of the, the of the fall term um, nevertheless so this, this became huge uh, courses or slash repositories of, of, of information. Um, of, they were done differently, of course, from, from institution to institution. I won't go, go here into detail, but I think that that was one uh, type of faculty support and, and development quite uh, um, uh, quite used in the past months. Then we also saw a lot of uh, live sessions. So that was asynchronous mainly, the online courses um, with some synchronous parts, uh, but then there were also lots of live sessions. And sometimes they were more general, again, as I just said, but sometimes they were also targeted. They are actually targeted for uh, uh, at faculty or department level, just to be able to cover exactly those discipline specific questions uh, that uh, that are usually not covered in the more general uh, online learning design material. Uh, also, it's a chance for faculty to actually come with their own questions uh, uh, on the topic and, and ask them. Um, then even more flexibly, we saw and we still see quite a lot of uh, drop-in sessions. So the idea here is to offer um, faculty a more flexible um, environment, a more flexible um, uh, framework in which just to come and to ask questions and to actually get hands-on support from learning designers and, and, and um, educational uh, technologists to, to be able to, um, to work on their courses. Um, and then, of course, the more passive part, uh, entire repositories of, of resources, both on the pedagogical side, but also on how different tools work. And I'm going to talk more about that here because this is uh, exactly one of the challenges that I'm, 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 uh, I, I've noticed. So we saw a lot of different uh, different approaches. These were just a few, or, or uh, let's say a grouping of, of the different approaches. Um, but um, even though generally they have been effective, it's it's still too early to tell anyway, uh, and everything is still in flux. Uh, but there are a few challenges that have become already apparent. Um, especially to those of us delivering those, uh, or at least part of that faculty development. Um, and first of all, it's the risk of cognitive overload. Obviously, there are there is so much information. There has been so much information since the beginning of the pandemic, and so many so many tools sort of thrown thrown at faculty. Um, of course, to help them, but still a lot of information to process and implement in a very short time. Then the idea is to try to find the balance between theory and practice. And what I mean here is, here is of course, instructional theory and, and learning theory, um, but also more, more general advice that can help faculty develop their courses in the future in both online and, and, and blended or hybrid mode and practice. And by practice, I mean really faculty coming and asking for very, very, um, um, easily applicable advice, something that can they can take immediately and implement in their courses. So a quick fix, a silver bullet, let's say. So walking the line between these two have, has also been quite uh, quite challenging. Then of course, there is the, the uh, at least from the very beginning, the reflex of faculty to really try to do a lot of synchronous interaction or to rely a lot on synchronous interaction. So the idea was to try to show them different ways, different ways, alternative ways of doing the same things, of achieving the same the, the, or similar learning objectives. So trying uh, different ways to engage students also in an asynchronous environment. It's not very easy because it's, it involves a shift of perspective. So uh, a, sh a shift of looking at your own course. And the last challenge at the micro level that I identified here uh, is something that we've been sort of confronted with as, as learning designers. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of demand for technical rather than pedagogical guidance. It really goes with the second challenge on my list. It, faculty basically wants something right now, a quick fix, something, a tool that we can recommend and, and just something that will solve their problems rather than how can I design engaging um, activities or fair assessment? Or so it's it's really really been quite tricky again to go between those two uh, uh, those two uh, ex not extremes but but aspects. But of course there have been also more chal uh, different challenges at the macro level. So a bit a bit of a different um, perspective here. We kind of zoom out. 
Um, and we're not looking at specific courses and needs of, of lecturers, but we're looking at the bigger picture. And, and here, perhaps I will start with my third one because that's the broadest. Um, there is a lack of a coherent and comprehensive pedagogical education approach for higher education. There is such an approach for, for teacher training at, at all the different levels, but not for higher education. In each country and each institution, there are different approaches, uh, different ways this is being delivered. So there isn't a coherent approach on which to build now when we want to share more about online education. Uh, then there is also a very diverse landscape in terms of resources and existing structures. In some countries, uh, in the US, in the UK, there is a lot of there are lots of resources put into this, uh, human and financial. So centers of teaching and learning, educational, um, um, uh, digital education teams, and and so on that have been at, at least now really coming into their own and really working a lot on on uh, during the past months. Um, not to say that they haven't done anything before, but still now they showed really that how important their role is. In some other countries, actually, are quite this sort of expertise is quite underdeveloped or sometimes even lacking. So this is very very diverse. And then it, my my third point, the first on my list, but my third point I I, I want to uh, emphasize as a challenge is actually that all this what I've talked what I've been talking about right now involves a change in routines. In the change, because we are used to seeing teaching as quite an individual endeavor. And this doesn't have to be like this, but this is how we mainly have been looking at it. So the idea of working in a team, including academic and non-academic staff, like instructional designers or educational technologists, this is a new routine. And a lot of people have, have been really, really friendly to it and have really taken it up and seen it as very useful, but it still needs to be developed as a routine in the future. So my last Two slides will focus on the way forward. I mean, we've seen what's been going on in the in the past six months, very very briefly. We've seen what what the, the challenges uh, with this are. Um, what I'm trying to propose here uh, again is just focusing on 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 a few issues. I, I'm aware that there are lots of possibilities, there are lots of things opening ahead of us, but I think. What could really work, and this is really again from my experience and experience of my of my colleagues and my peers. Um, what could work in the future to complement everything that has been done is showcasing good practice, practice in general. Also, because I want, I mean, what, what actually is missing at the moment is colleagues hearing from each other about what worked and what didn't work, just because there hasn't been that much done so far. I mean, there has been the emergency part, but perhaps that's not really, really telling or not to, 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 a, to a great extent. But what will happen in the next months is very important. And I, I think a lot of people will try a lot of new things. Some things will work for them. Some things will not work or will not work as expected. It's very important to share and to capitalize on this and to, to try to, to have people hear each other. Also to try to encourage people to work together in the sense of observing each other's online courses, uh, doing even peer review. And I'm using peer review here because... Um, it plays on, on, on a sort of research routine that we all have. So we're also used to reviewing each other's research, but we're not doing that or we're not very used to doing that um, with each other's teaching. So that would be something very useful as well. And in terms of resources and materials, perhaps keeping it to a minimum, keeping it to the, I call it essentials. But what I mean here is not hundreds of pages and hundreds of minutes of videos, but really very, very short one pagers, two pages maximum, or two, three minute videos on very, very focused uh, topics so that um, faculty can mix and match and take whatever they need when they need it. And again, zooming out and going at the, uh, and, and, and looking at the bigger picture, uh, what I noticed, and I really want to leave it on this very positive note, what I noticed in the past uh, months has been really an um, increase in networking. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about social networks, but lots of different professional networks as well, like, for instance, Eden and lots of other networks have been organizing a lot of experience and ex expertise sharing uh, in order to be helpful, in order to, to actually... Um, try to, to help everyone because, as I said, there are lots of places that have a lot of expertise and there are many places that have very little to nothing, next to nothing. So for that, it's very, very important to try to be as inclusive as possible. So I really like this development, trying to break our institution, to, to break away from our institutional bubbles 
uh, not to share only with our colleagues, but to share more globally. Um, and there are different ways to do that. And I'm, I'm really happy to, to talk about that. Uh, and there probably should also be a little bit more financing going towards that in the future, trying to build up uh, new, to build new networks or actually to, to enforce old, old existing networks uh, to enable this sort of sharing. And of course, the second point is uh, related to what I just said before, but this probably will take much longer, um, trying to, to work towards a more coherent faculty development uh, plan um, for higher education. But this is, this is a, a, a different topic, but perhaps we can already have a head start right now after or in light of the pandemic. And I won't say after the pandemic, because unfortunately it's not yet over. Uh, but yes, this is what I wanted to, uh, to share with you. And I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. You've really given us a comprehensive summary of, of, uh, of where we've been, where we've come from, where we are now and the way forward. I've really done a great job with that. I, I especially liked your reference to the global communities of practice and how important that is sharing our experiences with each other. And this question that is coming up uh, in the question and answer uh, chat box is, uh, do you really believe that people, faculty members, will share their negative experiences uh, amongst each other? What are your um, thoughts on that? It's a, it's, it's a very good question. I'm smiling. I smiled the moment I saw it because, of course, I it's hard to believe. Um, and I'm sure many people are not willing to do it. Uh, but I, I think if if I find the challenge for myself for the next month is try to get people to do it, because actually that's the way we can learn. Um, it's hard until someone starts. It's really trying to get the ball rolling. But in general, we are not very happy, not only in academia, but in general, uh, to report on our failures. Um, everything is just, you know, our CVs look, look perfect, only achievements, grants, everything. Uh, but actually, how are we going to learn if we don't see what hasn't worked? And, and so, so what I mean here is both personal, at a personal level, reflect on a personal level what hasn't worked, and actually sharing it, even if you share it with one peer, as I said, peer observation, or, you know, it, there has to be a system, of course, in place. But... Um, you know, in confidence and basically on a very collegial, uh, um, yeah, level, uh, I think this this can be really helpful. I mean, I, I actually personally would would love to hear what hasn't worked for two, three, four people, so that I don't repeat the mistake. But of course, I understand I understand completely uh, what you're talking about, and I think it's a very cultural thing as well. I think in the Anglo-Saxon world, that's from my experience. In the Anglo-Saxon academia, uh, this is much more. Um, sharing and peer observation and so on is, is much more common. Uh, I've worked in Germany. I didn't find it common. I don't know. My, my colleagues can, uh, can uh, um, yeah, confirm or, 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 or say different, uh, differently. But I think, I think it's, uh, it's something we have to try at least. I'm not sure it will work or not at first, but I think it, we have to try. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker, uh, but before I do, I just want to say be sure that you follow um, Alexandra on Twitter. She has lots of really great ideas that she shares on Twitter, uh, and also follow her newsletter because uh, you'll get lots of lots of valuable information there too. So moving on to our next speaker, this is Richard Powers, who is Professor Emer Emeritus of English Language and Literature from the University of Maryland's global campus, an expert online teacher, trainer, and instructional designer. And I know because I happened to take a class with him almost two decades ago. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he's taught online since 1998 using Web Tycho, Blackboard, Moodle, Brightspace, and Elias. Uh, currently, he's the project coordinator at the Professional School of Education, Stuttgart Ludwigsburg, here in Germany, for blended learning courses uh, on diversity for teaching and training. Uh, since the coronavirus outbreak, Richard continues to be a key member of two task forces preparing students and teachers uh, to teach remotely, remotely in this very confusing time. And with City Colleges of Chicago, Richard continues to support 3,000 teachers, 25,000 students online, and at Stuttgart, uh, 3,000 teachers he's been supporting and developing projects and courses and training. So Richard, uh, he's going to be talking to us about how we can improve on our current curriculum, giving us some very valuable tips. Uh, so Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hey, thanks very, very much, Lisa. 
And 20 years. Wow. Look how far, far we've come. Now we're talking heads right here. That's great. Just a minute. I'm sharing the screen. Okay. So how does that look, everybody? Lisa, can you see the screen? The first one setting up? That's super. Okay. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, I'll be talking about some kind of immediate priorities that people can do now. What I put together initially is some statistics. It's always kind of helpful. These were done by a Cengage survey done by Bayview Analytics from 6 to 9 April uh, of this year, just when the pandemic had started affecting most of our universities. Uh, they surveyed 826 admin and faculty over 641 United States institutions. So this information is very specific to that kind of thing, but I think you'll see a lot of tendencies and parallels for us as well. Uh, what the first infographic is really showing you is when it started, boom, 90% of the respondents said that they transitioned some or all of their classes online. The finding was a lot of the labs couldn't really do that, but 90% of courses overnight, as Alexander was telling us, that's a lot. 97%, you know, a more a telling statistic here too, reported that they used faculty who had no online experience at all, right? And some of you out there in the audience said it might've been you. Sure, you could access your email, you could do things basically, but now to deliver a whole course online. And the interesting part about that, the last 20 years have seen that some instructors have gone online and others haven't. There hadn't been a lot of pressure to do it. If you wanted to do it, you could. And if you didn't, you stayed out of it. But now all of a sudden, so there was a, that, probably that initial guilt too about, oh, I should have been doing this all along. That was adding a lot of extra stress to, to people too. All right, as far as teaching techniques, super interesting. Some of these are very similar all over the world. I saw people logging in from Mexico, from Croatia. That's wonderful, the Middle East. 83%, if you're fortunate enough to have resources, used it some kind of LMS. Uh, Blackboard, you know, Canvas, or if it's Schoolology or some Google Classroom, some kind of thing going on. 80% um, were using some kind of teleconferencing, Zoom or Skype, you know, whatever way that you could do it. 65% used uh, async recorded lectures. Now, here's a telling kind of statistic. 51% went to external sources. So, right, most of us teach in a classroom with a textbook. It's kind of easy to do. Now, all of a sudden, boom, you've got no textbook and no digital type of thing. So 51% of the people out there made that so all over the globe, too, had to kind of scramble and look for assets to try to do that. And that's where OER come in wonderfully uh, important assets for that. Open educational resources that are free. Uh, if you can have the time and experience, you need that background to put them together and then use them rather than going for expensive publications and institutions such as that. So you can see with that. Uh, this next slide is about the quality. 63% changed what they usually did. They had to. That's a big number of what they're doing from exams and assignments. And some of our institutions are more exam oriented than others. So that was a big deal. How are the exams going to be done You know, this way? 48% lowered their expectations. Well, that kind of can't be good, right? For the long run, you kind of see it in a chaotic type of way. So my talk today about my immediate priorities Let's get those expectations to the same or even, you know, better from what they were before. Uh, otherwise, where's the quality of this part? And Alex did a great job of talking about the tumult and the chaotic nature of what was going on. And now I like to refer to this as kind of a phase two area where we're going to more something that's more stable. We're not there yet, but we're moving to something that's a little bit. So now quality can come in where just delivery was part of that first part. 47% of American institutes went to a pass fail thing. So normally we use an A, B, C, D, F and a lot of schools in Europe, one, two, three, four, five. They said throughout the grades, it's just gonna be a pass fail for this kind of environment. Now for some courses, that might not be the best way to assess uh, learning outcomes they're reading into. And 46% uh, dropped their assignments or exams. So depending on the course, that's kind of important of how that's going to work in there. So what were the top recommendations from the survey? Stats are always, you know, you can move them around. Be interesting to see, they did another uh, survey in August so coming up will be the new ones that are coming in. Number one, right, was more information about how to support students. So this, my talk is primarily for, I don't know, institution level, VPs, administrators, deans, rectors. What are you thinking about and using this window of opportunity to build from that? Uh, if your country uses a, a year round school system and people are working throughout the terms, that's pretty good. A lot of the European universities, you know, we closed classes in July. We're just starting up right again now. So that July to October was lost space where people could have been working on projects. And maybe you did that too. But if you're just coming back and trying to figure out what's going on, 
planning for the future of seeing whatever this new normal is. If we go back to the classrooms in the spring or whenever, what's really interesting is so many instructors are new, have found new things that they do. They're probably beginning to take a lot of what they've learned online into their classroom for some kind of blend in there. But if you're out there thinking about what to do for faculty, what to do for your courses, don't forget about the students and, and their experience in there. Uh, greater access to online digital instructional materials was number two. So that whole thing we were talking about OER, how do we get that? If you're using a textbook, go to the publisher, perhaps ask if they have a digital project, a product that can just be plugged and played right into their LMS so that the teacher isn't scanning and doing all kinds of crazy things about that. Number three, advice about accessibility requirements. It's always important for learners with diverse needs. Certainly important this time that came out with learners who were having technical difficulties, not so much with visual impairments and hearing impairments, but now people who don't have access to those things. And then finally, faculty resources and training, as Alexander mentioned, so important for how to move forward. But notice that how important the student part of that was. A lot of faculty seemed like they could get it pretty good, but now they had 20, 25 students, and 60, 100 in classes. How do they get that kind of support so that it doesn't fall on the instructor to be a 24-hour help desk, but how do they go for help and where can they kind of find those things? All right, if you're a leader out there, right? A VP, and you're up there at the top. It was okay from April until probably June or maybe up until now to say, yeah, it's hard. It's challenging. It's very, very kind of difficult. But what now in phase two needs to be done with change management stuff is the leadership energy and the attitude should shift to a more positive type of tone, right? So if you're talking to your administrators and your department heads, super busy people, tell them what I just told you. Look, this is a window of opportunity to develop for the future. It's not just trying to put a band-aid to do it now. What do you want to do three or four years from now that you can be doing now to meet that part of the thing that's moving forward? This isn't going to be done overnight. It's baby steps. First, this gets done, but it's a process like anything else. So what's, what, what are our goals to do with this one? If you're talking to students as an administrator, the online learning experience is enhanced. There can't be this negativity about being, oh, it's bad. It's terrible. Or things are moving in. We've learned enough about it that it, it can be a rewarding experience. So if you're the leader, you need to put that positive spin on it to help people stay motivated through this practice. And last one, if you're talking to faculty, start saying online learning isn't as bad as you think. It's effective. Start having your faculty champions deliver surveys and uh, uh, webinars about how that's kind of work. Now, what else can you do? We live in a world of systems. I think we all know that, whether it's PeopleSoft with human, uh, relate, human resources, whatever's going in there too. So number one is if you're a leader, VP out there, get your systems talent together. I put these Venn diagrams. Alexander mentioned the silos of the vacuum effect that's out there. Usually at most institutions, there are people responsible for the academic technology. And by that, it's, sometimes it's the OIT people or the LMS, the Zoom, whoever's doing that. Then you have the departments that do the pedagogy and the academics. And then you have the IT people that put that all together. Find those people, put them together at the same time, the leaders at the meetings and, and Zoom or WebEx or whatever, and get them to start uh, small task forces on different issues that you're trying to work so that you're not just doing one out of the three. And part of that is good di due diligence with project management meetings. You know, a lot of academics have great PhDs, but they don't have a lot of project management experience. So turn them into project managers. Say, hey, Dr. Smith, you're the project lead for this. Now here, here's our, our template for minutes. Here's our spreadsheet with the milestones. Please fill that out and help them get trained to do this pretty well. You'll find that, they, that, that works uh, pretty well as they keep up with the meetings and the minutes. I mentioned these. If you don't do this, keep them in mind. This isn't just a temporary phase. What do you want to do in five years that now can be done as you move towards what your institution will look like? Have a separate technology plan, have an online curriculum plan, have professional development opportunities that people are working on, and finally, some way for feedback and evaluation throughout the whole way that's moving forward. Okay. Master courses. Okay, so what's coming at you fast and furious here, because I want to leave some time for discussion, is probably Rich's, that's why I'm you know, Richard, but I go by Rich, it's kind of nice, maybe one day it'll happen if everybody kind of calls you that too. But my top seven things that you should be doing some way, you know, in there. And that was the first we just talked about. Master courses have kind of a negative idea, but they're templated courses. Uh, most universities have a freshman level course that over 600,000 students take those kinds of courses shouldn't be so variously different so that the learner experience is so different with them too. So uh, start thinking about, since we have the ASIC component, having that ASIC component com um, applied to lots of courses, determine which ones are your bread and butter courses that lots of people take that you want high quality for, select learner or instructional design teams drawing from the talent, 
train the teams, first of all, establish milestones and deliverables, and then make sure they, the course goes through a quality review, right? We've done this at City College of Chicago, we've done it at Stuttgart University, and talk more in detail about that. But it sounds like a lot, but it's it's a process that moves forward and going together. So lots of uh, things to do with faculty training, lots of different initiatives. Alexander covered most of these. We found that the blended learning courses and workshops work very uh, well. Lisa and I took a course, she's talking about 20 years ago, Maryland was kind of on the forefront of that. I think it was a five week course and it went through modules one, two, three, four, five, and the teacher came out confident about what's going on. Have to return to those types of things. So we've whittled it down to about three weeks where there's a sandbox. The faculty gets the information, reads it, and then goes into a practice classroom and actually does it and somebody comes in to see it do it. That's the component that seems to be missing out there with faculty training. Lots of virtual, here's how you do it, but then nobody's looking to see if the person can actually do it. So that's helpful. Virtual drop-in hours, Alexandra mentioned this. External training, you know, you guys are in here for the webinar, that's super. OLC, some other organizations run these. Establish a knowledge base with a website and then uh, work towards maybe basic, intermediate, and advanced certificates at your institution so that people can uh, award uh, and, and move that too. Now, closely as I get through these other things that are moving in, um, there's differences in motivation out there. I divided these into two categories, enrollment-based programs, such as the states that are, you know, tuition. So they're very expensive. Students are paying for their courses, private classes, and then state provided, you know, it might be in Europe or another uh, continent or country where uh, the state is providing a lot of that. So there's not a lot of school guild coming in there. There's differences in motivation for your faculty to take all that training I just talked about. A lot of the American Australian faculty will take it because it means job security. If they don't get certified, they won't be teaching. Whereas in Europe, at least in Germany, the schools I work in, the teachers, especially those with tenure that are in, you know, have been there for a long time, aren't really super motivated to take all this additional training and go in. So that's where the department leadership is coming in. And budget is different too. You know, the way school your schools is is funded. Uh, with Europe, it's super important to keep your ear to whatever's coming down. What are the grants? What are the funding for the next year? So that you get money for projects for institution because it's out there right now. Okay. Last few slides, teachers and training, super interested. If you're a, a big wig out there at your school, look at where your teachers and training, the pre-service team, you know, the future teachers in the classroom and what's going to be done. Uh, offer courses out there about how to teach online and digital tools. If you don't have them right now, get them in there. Your students are taking classes now. They're the perfect audience to become teachers. Lisa and I know, and Alex too, and Marcy, the best way to become a good online teacher is to take a few classes as a student yourself. So these students right now, they're getting crash courses on how to be a good online teacher, get them the official training now. So when they finish their teaching degrees, they're ready to, to start teaching the minute they step in the door and they don't become a, a, a liability out there. Right now, if you're a teacher, start mixing digital products with that academic paper. You know, we do way too much probably with that 10 to 12 page essay. It's great. It's important. I'm not saying get rid of it. But if you've got three of those in a course, maybe turn one into a digital project, an e-portfolio, a project that can be worked online so that you experience with that. And then, you know, here in Europe, we've seen the e-twinning projects. A lot of you know that. They're wonderful. There's that whole teacher trainer institute projects that's moving, that are going on. So if your schools aren't involved with that, you know, please do that. The thing with the student orientation, super important. One hour virtual student uh, orientation is the beginning of the term. You can post the recording and the presentation on the website. After my quick talk, I'll put a link to City College of Chicago and just show you how kind of relatively simple that is. And then gather feedback for the pilot orientations. We found that if you have these a week before classes start, the week during classes start, it takes a lot of the pressure off the teacher, right? Uh, instructors can also be doing things course self-review for quality. A lot of you have probably heard these. I'll put the links after my talk. Um, OER means free, license means you have to be a member. So Sunny has their Oscar rubric. There's the Quokie rubric out of Illinois. The OLC scorecards are famous in the Quality Matters rubric. So if you're a teacher out there trying to say, hey, I built this course, Rich. I did this from April to August, and now you want to check it and see how it's doing, get one of these rubrics and just cross off so that you don't have to worry about waiting for that guidance coming. You can start designing it and making it work for you right now. Okay, just some quick other tips. You can read faster than I can and the slides will be made available to you. Uh, maybe the big thing is up at the top, if you're writing people's job descriptions and positions, start hiring people with a digital background, right? It might not be the most academic person out there with 15 books and tons of articles, but they might know Ilias, or they might have designed programs that are coming in there. So if you're hiring and you're writing the contracts for people, include maybe like number two, that along with your job, 
you will do digital training and workshops to help people at our college putting in there. So looking at the uh, PDs and the position descri descriptions for the next five years and make sure they have that in there. So you don't have to go out and pay extra money for that stuff that's moving in there. And Alexandra showed a great example of her newsletter. Bravo. Uh, we should keep uh, that kind of going in there too. So that in a nutshell are my top tips coming in and number seven. So I'm going to stop now. So at least Marcy has some time to talk. All right. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Richard. We've got lots of feedback on your presentation, lots of comments about, yes, this is wonderful. You, we need to talk more about the opportunities with online learning, and we need to really focus on, on what's good. We need to focus on improvement. Uh, so you've got a lot of feedback from, from the audience about uh, just basically say, this is exactly what we need. And so, I mean, there's so many tips. It's really hard to even find a question to, to ask because you've answered so many of the questions I'm sure many of our attendees have. Uh, there is one question um, from one of our, uh, um, to, from one of our uh, audience members, uh, is from Larissa, and she asks, is there research or some idea of higher education as institutions that are approaching distance and open education that we can learn from? Yes. There really are quite extensive bits and, and all kinds of articles. I mean, I wish I could make this laundry kind of list out there, but one very good place is, let's see if I've got a quick link with the OLC. If I put up this, I think this is their whole uh, website, but anybody can access the research that's in there. And then you just kind of search with OER up there. Let me the open educational resources and then finding. The problem with it is there's so many search engines out there, like Merlot, you can go to, and then you can go to, uh, you know, Creative Commons and these OER database resources, but it's very difficult finding those specific resources that you want. But the OERs that are out there, I can also recommend, you know, Susan Coe's book on blended learning and using online. Susan. O and Olena Zadko. Uh, I wish I had the link right to it. You can Google, if you copy their names and put it in uh, your Google search engine, it comes up and three chapters are available for download of that book. And it's very nice as she walks you through the process of how you put those things together and then how you, you do them. But the issue with OER is, is just that it depends on the discipline and then being able to find them and put them together for your course takes a little bit of time when you're putting them together. So Larissa, I hope that that answered. But the, the research about how effective it can and can't be is also dependent on the program. Like you'll find adult education programs differing from the K through 12 uh, programs differ from higher institution programs. Um, I, I want to ask this question because I think it's 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 really important. Then we'll move on to Marcy's presentation. Um, and this is from, this is from Sukena. Suke, 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 and she asks, how do you communicate to faculty the time it's going to take them to realistically design and develop an online course? Uh, this is indeed a challenge. And I, I know I found this in my practice as well. You just have to be brutal and frank and say it takes a long time and you're not going to get paid up front from it. And what you say then, too, is but the value is it of, of it is once you put in that hard work with it, you have it for the next five, six, seven semesters. It, it, it's a lot of time and effort up front, but the effort and the time that you put in, it's very similar to writing your PhD or a master's you know, thesis. You're gonna work, work really hard with it, but you're gonna get a lot out of it once you have it. Nobody can take your online course away. And what happens is you start tweaking it. So the next term you improve it. So after the third or fourth term, wow, you have something that, that's fun, that's engaging, that you like, and you keep adding it to it. So you just have to be brutal and kind of frank and say, there is no quick and easy way to do this with, with, with that, but that the payoff in the end, the benefits are there over Thank time. You. I couldn't agree with Lisa, you more. Is that what you found too, Lisa? Yeah. Yes, right. definitely. Yeah. Definitely found that the paybacks are definitely worth it. 
Okay, we're going to, move, thank you, Richard, a really, really great presentation. Um, we're going to move on to Marcy Powell next, who's going to be talking about the strategies for staying productive in this time of corona and sane. And uh, just to give you a little background on Marcy, she is president and CEO of Marcy Powell and Associates and has been at the forefront of many pioneering advancements in the workplace for the last 25 years. Um, she is an award-winning, internationally renowned keynote speaker, business consultant, and author, and has managed globally diverse teams and inspired over 100,000 leaders, employees, and students across the country, across the globe, uh, and six continents in both education and industry. Uh, some of her awards include the 2019 U.S. Distance Learning Association, USDLA Higher Education uh, Innovation Award, a USDLA Hall of Fame membership, AT&T President's Club, Polycom CEO Award, and the second, she is the second American woman who has been elected to an Eden, uh, as Eden Fellow. So Marcy, I'm with that list, uh, list of accomplishments, I'd like to turn the floor over to you to share your experience and your expertise on how we can get through the next few months or years. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate it. Let me get this PowerPoint going. And boom. Ta-da. All right. So glad to talk to you. And I love listening to what Richard and Alexandra had to say. Um, so spot on, especially in the need for uh, teacher training. And we were hit. We were blindsided. No one knew. COVID was going to happen. And then suddenly, not only are we bringing many courses online, thank goodness, organizations like Eden have been doing this for many, many, many years. Uh, and organizations like it, uh, collaborative organizations like USDLA and ICDE and others around the world. Uh, so we're very blessed that there's expertise and collaborative people you can connect with to learn. But what I would like to talk about today is the educator side besides the classes. So if we don't look for a moment at pedagogical, but let's look at what's going on with all the workload that's been put on us. The fact that we've been suddenly, we're working remotely. Many of us, Lisa Marie and myself, several of us have been working remotely for several years, but not everyone has. And it hit a lot of people. Suddenly you're not on campus, you're working remotely and you have to adjust. I have what I call the dinghy effect. It's where you have the mothership, if you will, the main campus is like a big ship where we all come and we all collaborate and work together. All the departments and cross collaboration goes on and other universities we work with and institutions. Uh, but then suddenly we're on this little bitty dinghy, this little bitty boat, that's attached to the mothership, but way out. It's only needed when it's needed, then it's loaded up and it's expected to handle all of that workload. But all in all, you're away from the hubbub of activity. And with that comes things we're very concerned with, the fear of missing out, the, the worry about out of sight, out of mind, when, when you're on a good career path or you're trying to... Um, get that recognition or get those grants or whatever it is you're trying to accomplish and suddenly we're remote. You know, we've worked for years to make the distance disappear in online learning for our students. How can we make them feel connected to the campus and as if they could reach it and as if they're there? How do we develop um, in our online courses rules of engagement and ways to pull them in and that collaboration and that community. How do we recreate that? How do we turn the, as Alexandra said, the theory into practice? How do we do that in an online course? Well, how do we do this for us to feel connected? So what I thought I'd do is share a few little tidbits that I've come across that will help us with some of the things that have happened to us, this overwhelming um, the overwhelmingness, if you will, of the new normal. We've had to adjust to new, new ways of working, but most of all, we need to figure out how to do it right now that we know it's still ongoing and we have to have a healthy work-life balance. So let's look at a few things. Um, many of you have already gotten your audio, 
your office is ready, you found a space to work, or in some of cases, some of us still float from room to room to room to room to work. There's some danger in that. Uh, there's some advantages and disadvantages, but we have to be ready. And with that readiness means defining your workspace and finding a place where you can get away from all the distractions and interruptions um, and where it can't invade your home, your your life. Um, it's like Richard and, and I were talking earlier and he said, I'm sitting on the couch and my phone starts beeping, or maybe it was Timothy actually that said that, and my phone starts pinging and I find myself working again when it was time when I was supposed to be not working. That happens. So we have to create this remote mindset. Two of the most important features of the remote mindset is having that agility and that resilience. We need to be able to act quickly to the change that so many people don't like to see happen. We have to be agile and and have resiliency in our movements and in what we're doing and think, okay, I can't go travel to conferences anymore. So how am I going to organically connect and collaborate with my peers? Well, recreate your water cooler chats, if you will, uh, what you, where you would meet in the office and the interactions that you had when you looked down the hall and said, hey, John, you want to go grab lunch together? How can you recreate those remotely? Well, video conferencing helps tremendously. Uh, some people have even created everything from pet Slack channels using a communications, a social communication tool, tool to stay connected to their colleagues, posting pictures of their pets, posting crazy pictures of them working remotely, posting pictures of where they wish they were while they're working remotely. But it builds that camaraderie. It strengthens that trust. It helps with that connectedness. So we have to do those kinds of things. And then finding your rhythm, one of the advantages of working remotely is that you can find what hours and times work best for you. And when you're at your peak performance, mine is early in the morning. As I was writing my last book, I would get up sometimes at 4.30 or 5.30 in the morning and just work all the way through lunch and get so much done. But if you ask me to sit down and write at three or four in the afternoon, I don't know about you, but my brain is dead. I can't do it. It's fried. So you find your rhythm that works for you when you're at your peak performance, and that will help you with productivity. Manage your time. You are the boss of your time. Don't let others be the boss of your time. And that's hard when people could keep piling more and more stuff on your plate. So you have to figure out how to manage that. There's some tips I'll talk about. Two little quick things, and then I'll go on because I want to stay within my 10 minutes. I want to hear all of your questions. Controlling distractions, as we know, is very important. And that's hard, especially if you have little kids and our chaos, what I call loving chaos going on at your house. You have to control those distractions and kind of lay some ground rules so everybody can follow. I had to run out a lot of people so I could do this webinar right here to say, let me focus, don't distract me. But there's also what I call intentional interruptions, which is where you take those breaks. If you've worked so hard on developing your course and you just got a module component done that you are so proud of, you've been sitting there solidly for three hours, four hours, take an intentional interruption, go walk the dog, go hug a loved one, go get a special cup of coffee, go do something that rewards you for your work, make the interruption intentional. And guess what? You'll come back completely refreshed. You will have such a fresh perspective and be able to knock out more work. And then, then focus on what, do what I call purposeful focus, which means when you need to go dark, don't let your phone interrupt you, your email interrupt you, and other people interrupt you on getting something done. Set your timer. A time, there's timer apps on computer. Set those and purposely focus on what you want to accomplish until you're done and then add an intentional interruption. So when you're crushing your to-do list, as they say today, 
There's some things you'll also need to do from high powered prioritization, where it's really where you figure out what's most, what's absolutely has to be done, what's good to be done and what can wait and put that prioritization in place and make yourself stick to it. Or you can work 24 seven, 365 and never sleep. So you have to decide what's important. Another one is sufficient excellence. And that's where I say, when you work really hard and you do something, we can keep working it and working and working it and never get our course out or never get that project done. We have to decide it's sufficient. We put our excellence into it, it's sufficient. Sir Paul McCartney recently was interviewed and they asked him, have you ever released one of your works that you weren't really satisfied with? He laughed and he said, <laughs> have I ever released a work I was fully satisfied with? That's the question because you can always change something. And like Richard was saying, you can tweak your course through the semesters. So make sure it's sufficient. It's excellent. Who's the stakeholders it's going to? Is it good enough? that they it does for them what it needs to do and then get it off your plate. And then finally, known commodity. The thing that we worry about quite often is our career path and being out of sight, out of mind remotely. We worry about where we're going. And the trick there is to have an air of presence. Make people, connect enough with people, connect with your colleagues, even with just five-minute chats, even a quick text, text to encourage someone. Volunteer for things that need to be done that no one else wants to do. It might take a little more time, but it can increase your presence on the campus, even though you're remote. We could go into that more, but I won't. Finally, um, I could have spent a lot of time going over some of the innovations in online learning from around the world. Um, here's a website that Dr. Susan Aldridge and I created uh, under Drexel University online. And what we did was showcase all over the world innovations in online learning that's going on all around us, whether it's um, augmented virtual reality, gamification, um, even taking videos and making a documentary course with teachers from around the world, instructors that give that practical application from around the world, uh, using all kinds of technologies, ed tech tools, to innovate and make our courses completely engaging. Some use different departments and collaborations throughout the university, uh, other departments like graphic design and uh, the Center for Teaching Excellence. There's so many resources out there and collaborate, collaborating partners. Um, so virtuallyinspired.org. Go look at those and you're going to see over 50 examples with little short three-minute videos and a landing page that gives you more information and then the links. So you can learn if you need some ideas. And finally, there's some other resources that we worked on. Uh, we have three white papers that you'll see uh, the online classroom of the future, uh, educating the next generation workforce, and then one about transforming the higher education digital ecosystem. So look at those resources on marcypal.co, not .com, and I'm Marcy with an I, not a Y, not an IE. And uh, so go there and look at resources. And then I have a book that just came out this weekend. I haven't even promoted it yet, um, but it's remote. Leverage the distance and achieve excellence when working remotely. I pulled a lot of tidbits out of that book for the presentation today. So if you want a more elaborate um, details, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and about 40,000 other um, outlets. You just go in and put my name in. That's the easiest way to do it. Marcy Powell and search and hopefully it will come up. Um, and with that, here's my contact information. I'd love to um, help any of you that need uh, anything or want to discuss anything. And Lisa Marie, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, lots of uh, feedback from the people that are here talking about how you really hit it on the head, uh, just the, the necessity of, of finding that time for yourself and, and really being able to manage that time. One of the questions that, that I have um, for you is, what kind of tips would you give to us for, for managing our time so that we don't become so overworked that we can't 
um, that we just can't manage. I mean, it's, it's, it's so important that we, that we stay healthy and that we stay in a state of mind where we can support um, our students, our, our peers, um, our, our families. What kinds of tips would you give us? Well, I think number one is to understand that your work is always going to still be there and need to be done. So don't let yourself get so caught up in it that you make yourself unhealthy. So for example, I might get ready to head for bed. I'm, I'm tired. I'm worn out. And then I go, oh, wait, I need to email Lisa Marie one more real quick thing. And then three hours later, I'm getting into bed. We do that. So the tips would be to set your own parameters and, and stick to them. Um, what I do is because I am more flexibility in how, what hours I work, I don't have a set time. So I every day almost look at my calendar and say, I'm going to work here and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to work here and then I'm going to do that. And mm-hmm. I set my parameters. So very clearly set those. Um, and if you'll practice some of those things I talked about with high powered, high powered prioritization and sufficient excellence where you'll uh, make yourself do that and manage your time um, like going dark. You wouldn't believe how much how easy it is to make yourself go dark and really get something done and say like, I'm going to check my email before I get started this morning and I'm going to stop 30 minutes after I start looking at it. And then I'm going to get this work done. And then this afternoon before I close out, I'm going to go back to my email and look and without looking at email during the day, you knock stuff out like you wouldn't believe. So that's very uh, healthy way to look at time management and in really making sure you protect, you protect your family time, your personal time. Um, That's what gives you the energy and strength to do what you do. So think of it as you're doing it for the university. It's a benefit for them if you do that protecting of your time. They don't want a burnout, unhealthy employee. Yeah, well said, well said, Marcy. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I have a question for all of the panelists today, all of our speakers. Um, you, the, the examples that you've shared with us, the tips that you've provided us, the, the different um, approaches that, that you've shared, uh, there was a common denominator, I thought, in, in all of them. And, and it was really about trust. So let's talk about trust, trust in oneself, trust in, trust in our peers, trust in our management, trust in our students. Uh, and for many of, like like I said, for many of the solutions that you've talked about, um, trust was really that that common denominator. So how do you think we can build this trust? What kinds of measures, what kinds of steps, actions can we take in order to build trust in a remote working environment where, for example, you don't have that opportunity to build relationships or to see those those um, um, the things that, that aren't said in an, in, an, um, in an online environment. Who would like to answer that question first? Okay, Marcy, go ahead. <laughs> and I didn't want to go first, but I, my, one of the chapters in my book, the uh, Letters of Remote T, is Team and Trust. And so, I, because it's top of mind, real easy for me to pull out. Um, one of the most important things you can do is to be a student of those you work with. Be a student of your student, be a student of your peers. And that means to get to know them, find ways remotely that you can get to know them and understand what their goals are and where the way they're held accountable at their job. Um, some of these things that are important to them. And then more importantly, what their passions and their giftings are so that you know how to depend on on each other and can collaborate. I might love doing something and I'm really fast at it. And you might take three or four hours to get that same thing done because you dread it. You just, you, you don't like it. Well, what if you said, Mercy, can you help me? And I could help you go boom, 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 boom. And you go, wow, that saved me so much time. And then guess what? You now trust me as I'm a trusted friend and you know I've got your back and you know that that uh, you, you trust that I would I have your best interest. That's my point. Be a student, 
of those you work with and and put their interests uh, on your list of, of being a good friend, a good colleague. Thank you, Mercy. Alexandra? Thank you, Mercy. I'm just going to build on your point. I think creating anything or training or empathy is, is the, best, the best kind of direction you can go right now. Because that's something that needs training to put ourselves in each other's shoes and try to see things from each other's perspective. But also, but also linking that, that course, course, trying to be honest and open ourselves, ourselves both with our colleagues and, and with our students, students and, and of course with ourselves, ourselves as well. well. Trying to be ourselves, ourselves. because often we are we now are a little bit intimidated by all the technology, trying to um, forward this picture perfect. Alexander, your connection is really is, is not coming over very well. Could you could you maybe yeah, check? I can hear you well, well but uh, uh, can you hear me now? No, it's it's not very it's not coming very well over very well. It has a nice outer space. Tone. Yeah, it has. It's like you're coming from. <laughs> la, 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 la. Yeah, like, like, no, is it getting any better? Or is it mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Well, that's a good part for trust technology. You know. Uh, right? yeah. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I mean, maybe I'll try with. Um, I'll try with the headphones. Just to make sure. Okay. I'm going to ask Richard to answer, and then if you could check your t- technology. Richard? I just want to say something that people probably already know anyway when we start off, is that trust is over time. It's not going to be like from day one. It's just over time. So if you're, especially if you're in a collaborative group or working on a project, make that project just as if not more important than the individual work so that you meet your di- deadlines. You're not showing up late all the time. You know, be responsible. Another thing with trust is with your email. You know, ask if you, if people send you email, if they don't mind if you send to somebody else before you just send it out there and all the little backstabbing, the game playing, just it, it, there's no place for it in education. You don't need it. So a big thing that's hard maybe for me, I'd always just tell myself, check my ego at the door. I work with a lot of arts, all stars out there. You know, they've got websites, got all kinds of things going for them, you know, all that stuff. But it's nice if we say, okay, bring it down. What's our project keep on that? And I go kind of focus and then realize there's going to be some give and take with that too, but it's it's amazing how long it takes to develop mm-hmm. the trust, how quickly you lose it just by one silly email, one BCC mm-hmm. that you didn't send or a comment that you wrote. And, you know, just be really cognizant of what you write in the email because before you know it, it's part of somebody else's snippet. You didn't mean for that comment to be included in, in that one. And maybe one other little point is be, be aware of the cultural differences and, and your own biases. Like if you've got certain things that you think about people Know that about yourself so that when you're engaging with them, and maybe this is just true confessions with me as an American working in German, oftentimes I stereotype just the wrong thing because in the end, I found out that this quick, fast kind of American way of doing it isn't always the, the best way to get there. That kind of a methodical, logical, practical approach you get to an end product about the same time as the other one. So, cultural biases, you know, have an open mind and, uh, yeah, trust it, it's, it's a great point, Lisa, because you know, is it followed one slip up just destroys the whole trust, you know, that you've built so hard to grow. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Very, very thoughtful comments. Very insightful. Alexandra, are you able to, um, to share with you, share with us your thoughts? No, I'm sorry. I still, we still can't hear you. It still sounds a little bit like you're coming from outer space when I know you're not that far away. (laughs) Well, that's really too bad. Um, well, I would like to move forward. We, we you know, have had a really, really wonderful, productive day today. And I want to thank our speakers um, who gave us such a wealth of information, um, sharing, us, sharing with us your, your, your expertise, your experience, your best practices, exactly the kind of thing that, that uh, was recommended by Richard uh, and, and, and Alexandra and, and also Marcy in terms of, you know, really helping each other out. Um, you know, as we try to get through this, this uh, very challenging, very challenging time. And so I just want to thank our our presenters, you were really um, just fabulous. So thank you very much for taking your time and spending it with us today. Uh, Finally, I'd like to tell all of our our attendees to be very, uh, thank you to you as well for participating, for, for being so engaging within the chat 
uh, and within the questions and answers and, and, uh, and for sharing your experiences as well. It's, 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 it's just a, a, just a wonderful community. Uh, I'd like to let you know that we're going to be having the Eden Research Workshop at the end of October. Uh, from the 21st to the 23rd, it is an online workshop, so you will be able to participate wherever you are. Uh, and also uh, to give you just a quick note about next week's uh, webinar session within the pandemic uh, education within the new normal, uh, and that is how to build communities of support for teachers. And that will have our speakers Maha Bali, Autumn Keynes, and Maria Zamora. So we hope to see you next week. And as I said, thank you again for all of you for attending uh, and also uh, to our presenters. And, and uh, we'll see you next week.